Thank you, Jesus. I am fully aware that you all didn't come here to hear me. I am not the star of this show. I didn't wake you up this morning. I wasn't there when you were born. I wasn't there when the world was created. So I am not the star of this show. It is God. God is the center of our attention, the center of our affection, the reason we come to church. I'm in the same condition you are. I need the Lord. Therefore, I'm in no condition to be the center of anybody's affection. I need the Lord just like you. So I am not offended when the Lord comes in. I know my place out of the way to let him. I'm just a vessel. I'm just a vessel. I am just a vessel. You may take your seats. And that was a perfect intro to what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to be brief because I'm not, I'm not the main attraction. If you would turn to Psalms 133. But the reason I'm, we were here is to, uh, we did a music workshop. And one of the two things we wanted, the main things we wanted to point out to everyone was the power of music. If you are not aware how powerful music is, music is a powerful medium that reaches everybody. Now we all have different styles and types and genres of music that reach us, reaches us, but music reaches everybody. And we must understand, we as the music department had to understand the power and the responsibility that we carry as singers and musicians. Uh, one of the points we brought out was, uh, I'm sure most of you have heard the scripture uh, out of Psalm 100, let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. So the only prerequisite to praise is breathing. That's it. Which means birds, dogs, fish, deer running around the forest, even the trees, because trees breathe too. If you remember from the science class, they do, we take in oxygen and put out carbon dioxide. They do, they do the opposite. Take in carbon dioxide and put out oxygen. They breathe. That means they can praise God. However, worship requires sacrifice. Go home and do a quick reference study in the Bible. Everywhere you see the word worship, between Genesis and Revelation, mm -hmm. you will see, when you ever see worship, you will see some kind of action, uh, bowing of the head, kneeling, lying prostrate or face down, or some kind of sacrifice. Everywhere that you see Worship, you will see it will be accompanied by a sacrifice or an act. So, when we and we don't sacrifice animals in this day and time in 2013, but what we must sacrifice now in this dispensation of grace is ourself, our ego, us with this flesh, because God is not here. You can't use this. The Bible says in John that they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit. And in truth, there's no flesh in the equation, which means all that we know that have to bathe, rest, and feed, this is interfering with what God wants to do. So we have to put flesh, flesh can worship because flesh needs breath. So flesh can worship, can praise, I'm sorry. But to worship, you got to put yourself aside. And that's one of the main things we wanted to get across in our music uh, workshop on this weekend. I'm going to be very brief. Because I came, uh, when we got to do this in January, I just wanted to be an encouragement, we did, to our family here at Mount Zion. And so the Lord made a way that the schedule permitted and we could come in and uh, contribute to the music department. But if you were turn to Psalms 133, I will not be before you long. Psalms 133, if you have it, say amen. amen. If you don't have it, please say wait. wait. I gotta wait. That Turn your iPads, your Bible, iPhones, whatever media you use. Just get the word. As long as the word, just get it. Amen. All right, we got all amen. Psalms 133. And you know you're in the right place if you see this. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the freshest ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard that went down to the skirts of his garments. Mm -hmm. As the dew of Hermon, and as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. Mm -hmm. You can take your seats. The word of the Lord is already blessed. I'm sorry, I want to also give honor to God, who's the head of my life, to the pastor of this house, 
to our guest pastors here, out of Pratt, and all the saints and friends and visitors here. I'm a son of Mount Zion. I'm glad to be returning home. And you saw my wife. That's my wife and my girlfriend. It's all right. If you got your wife and your girlfriend, the same person, it's okay. That is morally, ethically, and spiritually legal. You can know that, you won't have to follow. But that is, that's what I get to go home with, and I'm proud of it. Um, we'll go right into my text. Psalms 133. The one thought I want to leave with you over the next five to ten minutes is the power of one. The power of one. In Genesis chapter 11, look at it in your own time afterwards, you will see the story of the Tower of Babel, the Tower of Babel. If you remember all of the uh, nations of the earth at that time, let me read verse 1, it says, And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it, and it came to pass, as they journeyed from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. So this is early in Genesis, which it means it's close to the uh, civilization, beginning of civilization as we know it, just past the Garden of Eden. So all the people came together, and they had one language, and they decided, let's build a tower to reach to the heavens. And as the story goes in verse 6, you see, it says, And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one. The people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do. And now nothing shall will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. In other words, God said, these people of their own human effort have one mind, one purpose, one vision, and they're going to build this tower to heaven. God himself said it is going to happen. So as you read on the rest of the scripture, he confused the language. And this is the origin of many of the languages that we have in this day. That's one single Old Testament uh, story of, of uh, unity. In the New Testament, we have in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. You can read that also in your own time. This is when the Holy Ghost came. Jesus had already descended to heaven, and now the Holy Spirit came to dwell on earth to be our guide, our keeper, our teacher, now that Jesus was not here on earth anymore. Now we have God, the Holy Spirit, to be with, present with us on the earth. And in Acts 2, it says, and when, for verse 1, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it fit all the place where they were sitting. So what do these two scriptures have in common? You see a oneness and a unity and the power and the results that occur from oneness, from unity. In Psalm 133, we see uh, unity. Behold, I will not put pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity, which is oneness or harmony. In verse 2, said it says it, meaning unity, is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down Aaron's beard. And in verse 3, it says unity is as the dew of Hermon, that descended from mountains, upon the mountains of Zion. In this case, we see unity being compared to oil or anointing, or the presence of God and all the benefits that come with it. We also see unity as dew or newness or refreshing rebirth, restart. Because when does dew occur? In the morning, yeah, yeah. and a new day, and a new start, a fresh beginning. Now, I kind of football has so many good analogies that you can apply to life. Now, in football, you have a play that comes into the field. The quarterback gives a play in the huddle. And when the team breaks the huddle, they come up to the line of scrimmage, and they prepare to execute the play. Now, everyone on the team has a different role in that play. Everybody's not going to touch the ball. Everybody's not going to block the same person. Everybody has a different role but they're all running the same play. If any one of those players decides, I'm going to run the other play instead of what the quarterback called, he will be out of order and you're going to have chaos and bad things will happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Because the team is not on one accord. God has called us to unity. Unity in Psalm 133 equals anointing. Unity equals refreshing and rebirth. Unity only happens 
when there is alignment with a common singular vision and focus. And when that happens, when there's unity, there is anointing. Anointing means endowment with power and authority. There is refreshing from top to bottom. There were two things that I got from this verse. Was one, we must act in unity under one vision. Under one vision. And two, it starts at the top. They, in verse two, it makes the reference from the oil or the anointing flowing from Aaron's beard, from his head to his beard, all the way down to the, the skirts or the bottom of his garments. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. flows from top to bottom. Yeah. And if, I did a little bit of study. If you look at Mount Hermon, it's the highest point in Israel. So as the dew that starts at Mount Hermon, the highest point in the land, and these descends or flows all the way down to the mountains of Zion and so on and so forth, there is a blessing. The Lord has commanded a blessing in those heights. The Lord has commanded a blessing in unity. Pastor Taylor, I'm almost done. I came from Waldo of Maryland just to give you encouragement that there is power in unity. Mount Zion, I get, come here to give you an admonishment and encouragement that there is power in unity. One thing I can speak of for certainty that this ministry at 9, 916 Yuma Street, God has blessed this ground to take off in a completely high trajectory. I'm, I'm telling you from what I know. I've, I've seen it. We're in a great ministry now in Maryland, and I want to stay there. It's, it's going to be, I would like to retire whenever the time comes. But from what I've seen in all my travels, I can say, and my wife and you and I, we've been saying since we've gotten here Wednesday, God is going to take this ministry to higher heights that you have yet never seen before. Never seen before. Because of your faithfulness, because of your devotion, and because of your love for God, and because of your balance between the ministry and your family, and your professional career. I knew you as a soldier. We were in the same brigade. We went to NDC together, and I, I even talked to a a, a a peer of mine, and he remembered you. He had served with you at Fort Riley. He said, oh, I, rem I remember uh, First Sergeant Taylor, and he spoke good things about you. So you had a good name in your professional career, and now in your, your uh, post-army, your, your career now as a counselor in Europe, you have a, a good name. God has rewarded you with good children, and y'all continue to be good. <laughs> And bless you in this in this effort. But that's just the beginning. But what does that require? It requires unity from the saints and the friends, the members, the well wishes, the visitors, even the haters of Mount Zion. It requires unity because there's power in unity. When we the Tower of Babel showed in the human effort, just by coming together and making our own minds under our human effort. We're going to do this thing together. God, God himself had to say, i got to disrupt this or it's going to take off. Because what happened, that's one of God's principles. When there's oneness and unity, there's power. And God had to change his own principle for, because they were going to do something he didn't want to happen. That was from just sheer human effort and will. And then in Acts chapter 2, we see where the people were of one accord. They can't make the Holy Spirit descend onto the earth. But they set that atmosphere with their one accord and their one mind. God recognized it and he showed up. So Mount Zion, I'm encouraging you to unite as one behind the vision of this pastor and this place. You will see things that you have never seen before. You will see things that you couldn't imagine. The Lord gave our pastor in, in Maryland on New Year's Day, he gave him a word. You ain't seen nothing yet. And he said that's exactly how God gave it to him. As in, grammatically incorrect as it is, he said the Lord told him, you ain't seen nothing yet. Now, the conditions I know we have at our church are similar here. And it's the same God all over the place. So I'm asking the saints of Mount Zion to lift up your pastor in prayer. Do not bring him grief. 
Do not bring him burden, but bring a help to him. Lift up his arms as, as the young man did with Moses. Pray for him. Pray with him. Don't be a busybody trying to nag his children or hurt them. Pray and watch over them. Wish him well and do well. Pray for his success. Pray for his anointing. Pray for his refreshing. Because as we see in Psalm 133, when he is blessed and anointed, it flows down to the members. When he is blessed and refreshed, it flows down to the members. Right. When he is in imbued with power, it flows down to the members. Amen. You ought to want to pray for your pastor's Amen. success. Amen. And this goes for you all as pastors too. Because you God has given you that gift to carry that burden. I don't know how many people could carry that. That's, that's not a good thing to wish. Out of obedience, you're going to do it and God will bless you for it. But I, I've watched some pastors. I... Only if God calls me that I'll walk in it, but not of my own, uh, not of my own free will. But as you are blessed, God will bless the people in your household. So you ought to bless for your pastor, uh, pray for your pastor's marriages. Amen. You ought to pray, pray for your pastor's relationships with their children. Amen. You ought to pray for your pastor's finances. Amen. And you can help there by tithing and offering. Amen. Make sure you tithe. Amen. It's not to go into the pastor's pocket so he can drive a nice car. You tithe out of obedience to God. Yes. And God will bless you out of obedience. Yes. And you bless your pastor as he needs to be blessed. You ought to pray for your pastor's health. Yes. Pray for his strength. Pray for his right mind. Because as your pastor is blessed, it flows down Amen. to you. Amen. So, saints and friends of Mount Zion, I encourage you to pray for Pastor Taylor in his time of need. Pray for his children and their success, and God will bless you, and we're standing.